afternoon and welcome to the Carolina Codecast, the first ever episode of our new podcast for the Carolina Code Conference. Um, with us today is the conference founder, Joel Taddy. Uh, I was happy enough to join us. Welcome to the show, Joel. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, bear with me as this is the first time I've ever done this. And so I'm, I'm learning this stuff as we go, but uh, I wanted to to get you on after our first episode and hear a little bit more about the founding of the conference, where it came from, how it came to be, uh, you know, your, your best memories over that time. And, and just a, a little bit, uh, to kind of give people some, some history of, of, uh, where we were and, you know, where all this stuff came from. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to go through it. Um, should yeah. I just get started now? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so what, what are you doing these days? Where, where are you working now? So I'm at Zapier right now doing, uh, you know, and engineering things, um, and all the automations, um, mm -hmm. I'm specifically working in, uh, what's called tables, which is in a beta state right now. And okay. it's the quick elevator pitch is, uh, spreadsheets type storage built for automation. All right. I will keep that in mind if I can get them to sponsor this show, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so. So tell me, you uh, you had the idea to start the Carolina Code Conference back in, was it 2018? Yeah, it was 2017, 2018-ish was when oh. the idea, I think the idea started knocking around kind of late 2017, maybe, well, maybe early 2018. So I know that it happened late, 20, it was in like the last week in July, I believe it was. Okay. Uh, last weekend in July in 2018. But uh, so I shouldn't say that I had the idea for it at that point, because in order to get to like the origin story of the conference, we have to zoom back a little farther than 2017, 2018. And so I currently live in the upstate of South Carolina, um, with probably a lot of people who are going to be watching this. Um, and prior to that, I came here from central Iowa. Um, so I was in the Des Moines area. Okay. What brought you? Uh, it was, um, Employment with the Iron Yard, actually, okay. that come oh, teach in engineering and data science class. Yeah, okay. actually, I guess I'm wearing the .NET a cohort shirt today. They're just like the best shirts. Like ask anybody that went to the Iron Yard. They they had the best shirts. <laughs> nice. So yeah, so when I was in Iowa, that's where I started my career as a programmer. And in my early days of software development, I was attending all the meetups like everybody suggested you should. But once a year, there was this thing called uh, Iowa Code Camp. And Iowa Code Camp, at that point, it was largely organized by um, the Iowa.net group. And so, uh, but it was not a .NET conference. Um, it was a one-day event typically held at a local community college um, that they run out the whole place. At least at that time they did. I'm not really sure where they're at now. Um, but it was just a uh, cross-functional, multilingual or not multi I mean, like languages as uh, um, programming languages, uh, polyglot kind of a conference. And everyone was welcome, and it didn't cost anything. And it was all put on by sponsors. And it was just a great time to, to go and to learn. And I can't, I think it might have been my first, yeah, it was the first code camp that I would have attended. Um, I was encouraged to just submit a talk. And it's like, I'd been programming for like maybe a year, two years at that point. Um, and somebody was just like, Hey, talk about this other, this little project you've been working on, which it was, it's kind of a goofy little toy project that was essentially like fantasy football built on top of the, uh, Tecmo Super Bowl Nintendo game where it would parse out the stats and it would like run simulations and play fantasy football with those players, like, you know, Bubby Brister. And I want to see that now. It's a lot of fun. Like I ran a couple of simulated seasons and it never really caught on, but it was a lot of fun. But I submitted a talk um, how, and, and I talked about how like, I kind of built out the parser uh, for the stats because really it's just reading binary data from a ROM. Um, and so anyways, I really enjoyed that process because it built my um, confidence as a developer just to get to talk in front of a group of people. And I discovered that I like accidentally discovered some computer science concepts you know, along the way because my background is not in computer science. Uh, so it was just a really uh, engaging process. And 
over the years, it sort of became a thing where I just continually submitted talks just because it was a lot of fun and it was a lot of fun to meet new people and, you know, to, to share in my learnings. But eventually I moved away from Iowa to come to South Carolina. And I noticed that there was really nothing to replace that. Like a, a lot, of, there were a lot of user groups um, with varying attendance numbers and some would spin up, some would go away. And they, it's just sort of like the typical story with user groups. Um, yeah. There was really nothing to glue them all together. Um, that I was able to see, at least at that time, there might have been, but it just wasn't apparent to me. And there was some beginnings of chats happening in the uh, Slack group, the Hat Greenville Slack group, about possibly having like a yearly meetup for all of the uh, all of the the groups. It'd be like a dinner or like a holiday party or something like that. And it kind of just got me thinking, like, what if we had a one day meeting of all of the user groups but everybody from the user group can like can talk about something like a lightened or something and so at that point i created was it was it was called the hat greenville conf yeah I that. Point, yeah it was it, i created the channel and started inviting a bunch of people um keep in mind that i'd never organized a conference i'd never been a part of organizing a conference um but i knew what the end result should be the end result is that everybody's in a room eating food. Like I'd seen, I'd gone to a number of conferences, like big conferences, small conferences around the country. I knew like what the end result was. So it was like, as long as I sort of aimed at that target up there, um, I could probably fill in the rest and get things taken care of. Um, and so from there, I worked closer with uh, Robert Roscom. And, and he had sort of the experience that I lacked because I think he was involved with PyCon or DjangoCon or maybe even both. And so he knew yeah. some of the technology uh, that they had used to do the organization. And he was able to just tell me like, hey, these are going to be the things that you're going to bump up against. And these are going to be the things that are probably going to go easy. So kind of gave me some insight. And he acted as kind of like a, like a motivator slash um, just someone to bounce ideas off of. But I'd say mm -hmm. most, for the most part, he was a motivator because out of nowhere, he might send me a message like, hey, how's progress going on the conference? And I'd be like, I haven't touched it in a while, you know, as, as, as I would. So he, he was a big force for getting that first conference in 2018 across the, uh, across the finish line. And so with that, I sort of just like, I, I could, I took kind of like a field of dreams approach to it. I figured if I put a website up, made a Twitter account, um, and then just started talking about it in the Hat Greenville channel that something might happen. Like I might get a, in a room with 20 people or 10 people, or I have no idea how many people would show up for it. Um, but I had a couple of guiding principles that I wanted to follow. But may, may, and I, like I stuck to these hard, like one of, one of which was that it was going to be polyglot, right? It was going to be, um, it wasn't going to be a Python conference or a Go conference um if somebody wanted to represent those things in their talk that would be perfectly fine like if someone wanted to make a talk about and i think robert actually maybe or no it was i don't know who it did who did it but it was this is why go is really good for back-end web program that's a perfectly fine talk it's just as long as not all the talks are about go exactly. um so that first conference was really an interesting one because um shoot i cannot remember his name but somebody from plural site who lived in minnesota uh, he was, he, if he, he, he gave a talk, if we go back and look at the, um, at the, uh, list of speakers, we would see his name. I think his first name might've been David. Um, but yeah, he, he, he submitted a talk from, you know, wh where he lived in the Midwest and he was from plural site. And I was like, okay, They're like, this is, this guy looks like he's given a lot of talks to a lot of people, um, found out that, you know, plural site, like that's part of their, uh, their instructor's duty is to go out and give talks and it's part of their budget to just oh, watch nice. the country and do that. So I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah. But it also kind of like went against the other pillar that I was wanting to build on top for the conference, which was that I wanted it to be a very local, like you know, I wanted like small batch, local grown talks um, to, to be presented. I wanted to, and, and so for that, um, I sort of had this guiding principle of uh, if somebody local submitted a talk, you know, as long as it wasn't just like a, you know, like a self promotion thing, I would kind of bump them to the front of the line in terms of like, is this a talk that I would want to accept to the conference? And so locally, uh, local presenters, but for, for David, um, 
I welcomed him and I was like, okay, I mean, this guy wants to fly in. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. Um, so we had some talks submitted from, like, when I say local, I don't mean Greenville. I mean, like, Nashville to Charlotte, Atlanta. I think somebody submitted one from, like, Knoxville or something like that. So those yeah. were all general. We're in the corner of that four state area where you've got kind of some bleed over from North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia mm-hmm. and South yeah. Carolina all in the same place. But I, I discovered that on the, the conference, like, paper submission software, uh, listed it publicly. And there must be crawlers or something for that because I was getting paper submissions in languages that I couldn't read from countries I've never visited. And I just like could not put faith in somebody to buy a plane ticket to fly here from Latvia or something that to, to present to a group that this is a, not a paid thing. Like I'm not going to put you in up a hotel. I can't give you money for it because everything's going to be free. Um, and so which that kind of leads me to like the big guiding principle that I was going for is that like, I really wanted it to be free. I want it to be accessible, um, free and accessible though. Those are interesting terms that aren't always, uh, th- that go well with each other. Um, I learned some lessons about the conference being free, none of which being monetary lessons, more or less, um, talking, uh, like people and how dedicated they are to, to being, uh, so yeah, commitment lessons. What's that? Commitment lessons. Commitment. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard people say that there are some conferences that will charge $20 to attend. And then when you get there, they will give you the 20 back. That's something I considered the second year at, that I, I put the conference on is that like, I would just take everybody's money and then just get a big thing of cash. And if you showed up, you got your money back or you could choose to like donate it to one of the sponsors or to me or something like that. But I never officially did that. So, so yeah, so that first year, um, through the talk submission process, uh, I spun up a website at was it Squarespace, I think it was, or Wix. I mean, neither of which are sponsoring this podcast. Wix. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> it was Wix. But I did that because they offered the ability of ticketing at like no more than just whatever the premium cost was to have your domain. So um, the website being like just a drag and drop thing, I didn't have to worry about building my own website, excuse me, for this or anything like that. So that was taken care of. And after that, I kind of just like took a very passive approach, very, very different from kind of the approach you're taking with a very active, like an engaged approach with social media and people with the, uh, there are trade-offs to that. (laughs) Oh, sure. Sure. Well, I mean, the big trade-off, like one of the things that I saw was that there would be weeks where I'd get no RSVPs or signups for it. And then there would be another week where there'd be like 20. And for those first years that I ran the conference, I kept the, uh, I kept the registration at a hundred and that was a random number I picked. I picked a hundred cause it looked good. Right. I hadn't, I didn't think at all about the, um, and space or what it could handle or anything like that, which choosing a venue caused me a lot of stress because yeah. I'm, I'm not an event planner. Um, and so the minute I went out and I think, uh, so Robert and I, we pitched some good ideas of, uh, where the, where the conference could be. And so the library, the local library was a good option, um, because the, at least in the downtown Greenville library, they have a large room that you can remove partitions from, but there was really good. I can't exactly remember what the reason was, but that wound up not being a good reason i think it was just because like those rooms couldn't be departitioned for when we needed it like somebody else had booked it out that far or something Hmm. then i started looking to more like uh more commercialized spaces like a hotel or something that um and booking a hotel is uh was not compatible a lot of the pillars that i wanted to go with like you know it being free and things like that yeah i priced the hotels it would be impossible for it to be free at a hotel for sure. Right. Unless like, yeah, there were, there were some very uh, generous sponsors this for this first couple of years, but having it at the hotel would have probably required us having some sort of like charging like for ticket price for that. So like hotel is kind of a non-starter because I couldn't make it free for the attendees. Um, and so that first year, actually one of the sponsors, um, was the Brickyard uh, and it was, they were a location sponsor. It was just like, Hey, there's, um, it's, it was like a co-working. I don't think it's there anymore in the next innovation center. It was over by Synergy Mill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in that same building. The next manufacturing. manufacturing next building or something like yeah. that. Um, 
And uh, I was just down the hallway from Synergy Mill, which was actually a really cool sort of caveat during that day was that um, a lot of people who didn't know what Synergy Mill was were able to take a tour of it and see what was see what was offered over there. But yeah, so but that um, was a large co-working space. It was a very industrial looking space. Like it had the whole like exposed duct work and just a concrete floor. Um, it was kind of a cool vibe, probably not the best acoustically for somebody to speak in a large room um, with everybody. And uh, and I felt like that that went really well. I had a lot of good feedback from the attendees. Uh, and uh, I even had some like raffle giveaway things from JetBrains. I, I reached out to them just randomly because I know that they would give away things for user groups. And so I was just like, hey, you get things for user group meetups. But I'm having a one day thing. Can I have some license keys? And so they were nice enough to, I think they had like one year subscription license keys to like whatever their all access or it was maybe IntelliJ or something like that. Yeah, um, they're doing the same thing this year. We're getting, we're getting, I talked them into two. That's uh, incredible. Well, it's such a great prize. It is. I mean, it benefits them too, because once that year subscription is over, you can't exactly stop using. Jet exactly. So. And it's it's such a good product that if you haven't been introduced to it, you really need to be. They're not yeah. sponsoring the podcast either, but whatever. Jet Brains is great. <laughs> yeah. At this point, we're just we're we're just yammering yeah, on about our own preferences. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. So that first year was really good. Um, I, I learned a couple of things in the process, and I think one of the things that I learned was like uh, securing the venue was probably the most important thing. Because in the second year, that would prove to be one of the one of the big challenges um, where I think I, 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 I can't remember fully because it was a couple of years ago. It was pre pandemic. So, of course, all of my knowledge of pre pandemic things uh, completely went away. Um, there was a uh, there was an event that caused me to lose the venue a couple of weeks out. Oh, from, yeah. yeah, from the uh, from Did the. I do remember that actually. Yeah, yeah, and I, like I, 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 unfortunately for the viewers at home, I can't remember what happened, um, or either that or part of me is just choosing not to remember it. Just to, was the venue being donated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it was a it was a sponsor, I think, and then they chose that like, hey, we don't want to sponsor this thing anymore. I don't um, know. And so in it was very similar to how like the Brickyard donated the space, and they were like a sponsor through donating the space, and and so like became quite a problem because suddenly now we're like three weeks out or maybe even two weeks out from the from the event and i have to like update the website and be like i don't know where it's going to be now but uh, actually the company i was working for at the time kind of saved the day um because they were to they were able to act as a location sponsor at the next innovation center this was acs technologies yeah uh, they were like yeah you know we we can be a location sponsor because we're uh they had an office in the building large large office one of the largest in the building yeah, uh, acs does a uh, church management software i believe right yeah and so so i was currently working there and i just reached out like i knew that they did some community outreach things and like next innovation like at that time you know you wanted to open it up and on a weekend you had to have a company with an office that could sponsor like you opening it and you also had to pay for the air conditioning cost for that time which i thought was really interesting um and like you had to do all the cleanup yourself. It was just a very like lo-fi kind of thing. Like, you know, it's just a, a handshake agreement. There's no paperwork involved. There is an invoice at the end, but um, but yeah, uh, it, 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 the cost wasn't even all that much. Like had I known like what it would cost to for the HVAC to be on during that time, because they do that for like, I think like green, like building materials and things like that. They do that for environmental health. They don't run the ac on the weekends so to have yeah. that on i think it was like less than a hundred dollars like i could have sponsored that myself if, if we needed to in an emergency but um yeah so so they took care of that that and, and they really saved the day had a lot of good food sponsors um i remember that year too we also featured the uh, recent graduates from carolina code school because they were in the next innovation center as well yeah so let's sort of give them a, a stage to talk about their experience which kind of went like it was meant a lot to me to be able to do that because my early days of going to a conference and like being able to get in front of a stage and, you know, it wasn't like looking for a job or anything like that, but it was just like, for me personally, it was huge for getting that, that level of uh, comfort with myself as a developer. So absolutely. You meet a lot of people doing this and, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to see this brought back. Cause I know after, after 2018 and 2019, you had built up a following. 
on this. And everybody was asking, you know, going up to, uh, to 2020, right up until COVID shut everything down. Right. You know, right. we're doing the next one we're doing. And then it became a thing of was coming back in 2021. It's coming back in 2022. Um, and I know it was always a, a big topic, but you, you clearly built up a following. People really love having the event. And I've met a lot of great people at those events. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, getting to see the sort of the, the amplification that people got once they, once they spoke at the conference and, you know, how much more well-known in the community at the time they became. And you've, you've got people like Christina who are just, uh, just a force for the community, uh, who, you know, got to sort of announce herself in front of everybody at one of those conferences. And now everybody in town knows her. Right. Uh, and she's just relentless about, you know, helping people get into programming and everything else. Christina is also not sponsoring this, but, you know, she's, <laughs> she, uh, she's done some pretty incredible stuff. Well, I mean, she's also put in the legwork too, right? Like the, yeah. like the conference, you know, is a, a small form of just like to say what you need. And, you know, she, she continually put burn, burn the calories to get her work done and to make, make herself known. So Christina yeah. is listening. I'll have you on here at some. So. There you go. Episode two. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, with with the pandemic, you know, everything shut down. I'm sure we all remember like how uncertain everything was. And then I, yeah. I think it was like one of the first the first opportunity because <laughs> it's actually kind of a, a fun caveat on like why the conference is in the end of July. At least it was at the end of July. Um, it was uh, I, I think it was Brian Kennedy who lives in the area advised like don't get too late because people here in the South. Remember, I came from the Midwest. People here in the South they love their football, so you can't do a yep. Saturday. Um, also it's very difficult to do on Sunday because a lot of people go to church too. So if you want to on the weekend and it's an all day thing, you really should go for a Saturday, but it shouldn't interfere with college football. And yep. so that's where it was just like, well, I really like, you know, I prefer it to be in September. Um, but then with August, you've got school starting. And so July is sort of like that end of the summer sort of like go out with a bang at, uh, in your last weekend. And I also remembered like the significance of the last weekend in July um, for where I was from in, uh, in well, not from Iowa, but where I previously lived in Iowa, they do a, a bike ride across a state called Ragbri. And uh, it was called the Registers Annual Great Big Ride Across Iowa. It's Ragbri. And it's a, it's a week long event where you start on the western end of the state and you ride over the course of the week. And it's really just a big party. Like it's not a fitness event. Um, okay. And you end up on the eastern part of the state and the ride is different every year. But I remember that like it was really easy to remember when it was going to happen because it always happened the last weekend in July. Like you never had to worry about what the day was going to be. Like the day would change, of course, but the last weekend in July or the last, it started the last week in July was the thing. I wanted sort of an easy to remember kind of thing, a uh, thing going forward with that. So it's like, it's always going to be the last week, Saturday in July. So, uh, I don't know, like, if that has continued. Um, the football season caveat continued. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're in, uh, we're on August 19th this year. And that's basically the last possible date that we could use that wasn't football season. That's right. Uh, and so uh, the only other alternative would have been, you know, if we did it in the middle of, of the fall at some point. It would have only been on the Clemson Open Day weekend because I'm biased, right? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're, I'm, I've actually found that this this August date, I wasn't really sure that I was going to go with it, but it looks like it might be a good time for next year too, around the same time, because school has gotten to where they start back around you know, beginning of August now. So yeah, people are um, people are in more of a routine at this point, and so. The summer vacations are, are kind of done with and everybody's back. The kids are, you know, back into their very active schedules or whatever else. And it seems like everybody generally has that Saturday before football season really bogs everything down mm -hmm. uh, in the best way. <laughs> oh. But yeah, so, so we'll see. I don't know what it's going to actually be next year. I'm still trying to work that out. I'm, that's, that's actually the big goal for this year. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it or not. I'm, I'm working on it because, as you said, venues are tough. But I'm really hoping to be able to have the date and venue set up for next year to announce at the conference this year if there's any way. Okay. I don't know if that's actually going to be possible. I don't know if that was a pipe dream situation for me or not. But because uh, venues are tough, especially booking them a year. Yeah, I mean, depending on how much you need, like up to book it too. Like if you just need like a, a financial commitment, you know, your sponsor also is going to need to be on board with being able to front that, you know, for a different next year. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's, that's actually one of the other complications. We kind of, it's still free this year, but if we're gonna do it consistently, 
there are a lot of expenses that go along with this. And I'm, and we might look at uh, doing a small charge for for tickets for next year just to help with the booking of the venue in advance piece. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's the sponsor meet and uh, the sponsor meetings are pretty involved. And we've we've got a lot of wonderful sponsors uh, this year. And those those conversations do take a very long time to, to kind of work through all the details of it though. Yeah. But well if if you want to stay the like making it accessible kind of a thing, like I have seen conferences I think this was specifically PyCon because PyCon's an expensive conference to go to. Yeah. Uh, but like they have a caveat too that like you really want to go, but you can't afford it or or it would cause you financial hardship. You know, they have like a fund that would scholarship for people. Yeah, it's like a scholarship. And I nice. if I'm remembering correctly, it was like a thing that you you don't even have to give a reason. You don't have to go into detail about why you're having financial hardship. You just ask for it and and it would and it would be covered and i think that conferences like that really want to like boost accessibility or even have people from places that like they you know they just can't swing that financially but maybe maybe they have the time for it um, especially if like the cost goes up a lot um having a, a scholarship that just anybody could like hey you know it's like on a personal level like i could buy 10 tickets or something like that like i can swing that from myself and that those would be available and you know as for attendees that have some sort of financial hardship. Yeah. Give it, give that, give that a thought. Well, you need to add price to it. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely look at that for, uh, uh for next year's, um, and future year's events. That's a, that's a great idea. The, um, it, there's, there's a lot of weird complexities with the conference. one of the biggest things that I, that I found kind of accidentally or not really accidentally, but just through the act of going through and looking at venues for now, for now and next year is that because of COVID, People were cooped up for so long that now there's a huge demand for people to get out and there's much more demand for the venues. So all of the venue prices have skyrocketed. And if then you'll talk to them and you'll find out that uh, a lot of stuff for the next two years is already booked up anyway. Oh my goodness. And it's, it, it's a, it, it's an interesting, we were, we were lucky to get a venue this year for, at the rate that it went. So planning ahead is going to definitely become a big factor in, in the, the long-term stability here. Is, is this year, the conference all the planning this year is this just been you or have you been working with um someone else uh it's it's pretty much been me so the my my big thought on this is that um i'm hoping to i feel like i need to do everything this year so that next year i can ask people to help and still then but know everything that is going to need to be done for these different jobs to more effectively tell it mm-hmm. like next year i'm going to need help with social media I'm going to need help with, uh, with, uh, gathering sponsors. Those are, those are by far the two biggest things in terms of, uh, in, in terms of time. I also found that, um, getting other people to read proposals and have like sort of like a, a vote process for that can take a lot of stress off of the planning as well. Cause like that, cause I remember that you reached out to me and you said like, you know, picking a talk is a challenging thing. And I definitely echo that sentiment. Yeah. Especially at a polyglot conference. That that was the only reason I didn't get people involved this year is because, um, you know, there are tools I mean, we're using session eyes, uh, this year to get, to take submissions and they've got a lot of great tools to pull in a team and evaluate and you can score talks on different criteria and whatnot. But one of the biggest things that, uh, with the polyglot conference is that I, I really wanted to make sure that we had a good diversity of topics across different languages and everything. And you might look at one talk and another talk. And a third talk and, you know, the, the second talk on the list looked really, really good and potentially better than the third talk. But if you've already got, if the first talk was already in the same language or topic, you're looking at overloading. Right. And so you ended up having the, I ended up breaking things up into about, you know, I don't know, about 15 different categories and then rating for each category and then piecing things back together that way. I felt like I needed to be really hands-on because of that. Because <laughs> it was going to be talking to other people. It makes, yeah, it makes you think like you put in all of this effort to like quantify it and an attendee might see the li- this list and just be like, what were they thinking? <laughs> and you're just like, no matter how much work you could have put into it, it might, it could, it very likely will go unnoticed. Yeah. And, and so, but to, to your point, I also did want to make sure that it was uh, localized. So we have one speaker from out of the quad state area that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's coming in from California, but he works for Red Hat and Red Hat is technically based in Raleigh. So it's kind of local. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that works, but, uh, yeah, so, and we've got people coming in from, from Tennessee, North Carolina, uh, but 
for the most part, we've got a lot, we've got, I think about eight speakers from South Carolina and it's very heavy on the, on the South Carolina presence there. I don't actually think we get anybody from Georgia this year and I meant to, um, hmm. But, uh, so there was definitely that, uh, it, it wasn't, that wasn't the deciding factor in any of the talks. It just sort of happened that way. We ended up with a lot of really good, good talks and diverse topics that I thought would look pretty good. If you're curious to see the speakers list and you're listening to this, visit carolinacodes.com or not, Car- not dot com. Carolinacodes.com will actually redirect, but the website is carolina.codes. And as our little, plural, uh, right? uh, yeah, code plural, I did go and actually register carolinacodes.com. And just set it up to redirect just because it was a point of confusion for everybody. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and, and apparently I can't even say it. it's carolina.codes. And it's right now it's, uh, it is a sub stack blog. Um, so I could get, uh, you know, people can subscribe with their emails and they can get updates as new things happen. So we did a lot of community polling with everything this year. And, but, and I do, I probably should, um, like retroactively apologize for the dot codes domain because I had something like Pucky and, when you're looking, when you're looking at Namecheap too, like Carolina.codes domain being two dollars for the first year, it's really attractive. I guess it kind of, it kind of went up this year. Yeah, it, now now it's a fifty dollar annual renewal, but uh, <laughs> but I do like it. I mean, it, it looks good on paper. It's just a matter of getting people used to used to seeing it. So I feel like it's easy to type too. Like just I don't know. It, you know how some words can be like yeah. ah, this is like a finger exercise. So it just seems to type it easy. Exactly. And now you get redirected to blog.carolina.codes because that's where the subsec is. And eventually, you know, I have an entire design that a volunteer put together, uh, put together for me. Yeah. Uh, Ryan actually uh, did this and we'll hear more from him later. But, um, but he did an entire design for us. I just haven't had time to sit down and get it set up. And so that's probably going to come after this conference at the rate we're going. We'll, we'll stick with this up stack all the way through because it's been working for us so far. As long as it can communicate like the details and, speaker list um location yeah and, uh, well, possibly uh, an itinerary so what was your favorite thing um, that you remember about the, the 2018 conference the 2018 that would have been the first one right so i think my favorite thing was uh, are you, you mean like what favorite talk or just like the favorite no, just in general what are your what are your, some of your favorite memories from that uh it, it would definitely be when it was over and i don't mean that like in a terrible way i mean like after all the talks were done, everybody kind of just hung around. Sorry, I'm getting kind of blurry here. Um, everybody just kind of hung around and caught up. And, you know, there were these groups forming where there'd be a number of people who knew each other and there'd be a number of people who didn't know each other. And maybe they would form their own group or maybe they'd latch onto another. Um, and it really hit to the core of just like having the one time, like that one event of the year where all of the user groups could come together because uh, it was a single track conference, so there was there wasn't very much in terms of uh, like hallway track. You know how they say like if you don't right. like if there's a bunch of talks going on and none of them are interesting, you, you can always just hang out in the hallway and and talk with other people about whatever you want. You know, the the design of the conference those years where there was just like a single track focus, uh, there were no parallel tracks, uh, didn't give people a lot of opportunity to uh, to mingle other than the meal breaks or the be- the beginning of the conference and. I both times I felt like when people were like rolling in at whatever, like nine o'clock, whatever time it started, uh, they weren't feeling very chatty. The coffee yeah. hadn't been flowing yet, but at the end of it, yeah, it was really cool to you know, just to get to just go around and jump around and chat with everybody and see some old familiar faces and, and meet a lot of new people. So, yeah. So I, I really like the single track format and I'm, I want to keep it up as long as I can because you don't get the hallway piece there but there's still time for for networking and stuff after the conference but mm-hmm. um but from from speaking at, at different types of conferences uh you know, one of the things that that we really want to do with the conference this year is we're trying to amplify the speakers a lot so we're going to have a videographer in there that's going to be recording all the talks so we can nice. publish on youtube later but uh but i remember i i gave a talk uh when i was working for d martian two years back and I had the same talk and I was going to be given it uh, at two different weeks. One, I was going to be given it at a conference in Nashville and I was going to be given another conference in Denver. And I went to the conference in Nashville and it was a talk on email security or on, on DMARC or email authentication with DMARC. And, you know, that conference was an eight track conference. Jeez. 
And I mean, it was huge. There was like 3000 people there and uh, it was a, it was a big InfoSec conference in Nashville. And I'd done all this work and prepared and I got into the room and then I'm up against eight or seven other speakers in the same time slot. And when you're picking talks, there's no one that's going to look at a list of competing talks and go, I'm going to the email one. That's super interesting. Fair enough. And so I got in there, I had a room that would have, that would have seated 200 people and I had five people. Okay. It was a good, it was a good talk for those five people, but it was really deflating to, to do that. And then I went to a conference in Denver and it was maybe 200 people, but it was single track and they had, you know, speakers from like, uh, you know, like SendGrid and SparkPost and some of the other, uh, the email companies there. And uh, I got to speak at that conference and the response from the room was fantastic. Speakers were referencing each other because we all had a common point of reference since we'd all watched the same talks and everything. And that, uh, that deflated aspect of, you know, being all excited that you got picked for a conference in the first place and then having to compete with the other conference submitters in your time slot is just, it's a bit much. And so that's one of the main reasons that I'm, I'm become a really big fan of the, the single track format, but you're right. The rest of the network time. That, that's a really good argument for the case of the single track because I, I, I mean, not necessarily as a speaker, but I've seen that as well, where, you know, when you meet up with other people throughout the day, like you're looking for someone else who was in that talk, like so you can ask some questions or yeah. like, maybe dive deeper. And it's nice to a lot of times, like get the summary of another talk, but it has this, it has this like atmosphere that reminds me a lot of like going to a really big concert where there's multiple stages. And like you as a, as an attendee, you have to be like, oh, do I really want to go see my favorite band or my second favorite band? Right. <laughs> like, like, exactly. no, like those should not be going on at the same time. You know, you're going to miss one of them. But with advancements and recording, like it makes it a lot like, oh, no, I can go see this later. But again, you get those talk where you're talking to an empty room and those are, they're not fun. Yep. And so that's one of the things people are going to be encouraged to do is just because it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's single day, single track with people kind of back to back to back throughout and tell people if you need to get up take a break. If you want to go chat with somebody in the hallway, feel free. These are going to be recorded. Um, and so, uh, we'll make the speakers well uh, aware of that ahead of time. But so from, you know, I know there's, uh, you had some really great photos from that first uh, conference. Who was the, who was the photographer for that first conference? I, honestly, know? like, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, on the website, he I, just I showed up and started taking pictures and was like, Hey, I took a bunch of pictures for your event. I was like, thanks. I did. I mean, like in I'm very thankful for that because I needed the material for sure. Right. I was very thankful as well. I mean, it, it probably could work out like in the, in, in future years to like just hire yeah. a photographer for it. Right. Like, I think you said you've got a videographer there. So we got a photographer for this year too. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That, that's a great way great thing to even have like, you know, if they're over there working on their photos during the day and then like at the very end when you have like your time for just like hanging out and finishing off the snacks and you know people want to pitch in and help clean up those kind of things like have pictures going on you know kind of like you do at a at a pumping up birthday party where the kids see all the fun that they just had <laughs> absolutely absolutely i mean and you know the the biggest thing is to grow this thing long term we've got to have the, the social media presence for it i don't know anything about social media i'm just publishing stuff and i'm trying to not over publish anything in a single given day but uh you know, it seems to be growing on its own at some point. And so hopefully the combination of the videos and the pictures, of everybody having a good time will be, will be fun. I really hope people participate in the networking events afterwards. Cause I know I didn't hang around previously at the first two conferences. I just, I was there for the day and then I, I left to kind of come home and do family stuff. And so we've been trying to really actively promote the networking activities because we pulled ahead of time. Everybody wanted to do some type of networking activity, whether we were a single day conference or a two day conference and had, you know, activities on the day in between or on the night in between yeah um i think when you have a majority local audience it yeah. is much harder pre to predict if people will be at the after things because you're really asking them to go hang out with you know at, at a place they've probably been to before or with people they've probably been there with where like when you go to like uh you know a destination conference like in california or something where there's thousands of people there you know, everybody's like, I've never been here before. I got to take it all in. I'm away from my family. Maybe, you know, I, I know personally, like I probably won't be attending the the after things just because like, you know, it's, I want to go home and see my, my children a little bit on the Saturday. So, whereas yeah. like I was traveling, like, I'm not going to see them anyway, other than maybe a FaceTime. So 
Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the key to that is to make this, turn this into a destination conference. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And so <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on growing it into that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's already really poised. Uh, it's poised well geographically for a regional conference, right? No longer Please. just like upstate South Carolina, you know, have it reach it, it, the thing to take it back to like the, the live music analogy or like discussion. It's like the thing that keeps large acts away from Greenville being its proximity to Charlotte and, uh, and Atlanta almost acts as like a draw as like a common neutral ground, right? Like a, a conference in Atlanta, unless it's like a big blowout conference, like sponsored by Red Hat or Microsoft or something like that, you're gonna get everybody from Atlanta. You know, yeah. The Atlanta conference it might be a different one somewhere else, but like, if you're like just a grassroots regional conference or many highways converge towards or, or past it could be a good one. Yeah. The easy access to Knoxville is I think something that people really take for granted because there's a really big presence up there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was able to, to kind of promote the conference to some groups over there, just, not just online. And, uh, and they were very receptive to even getting local speakers to speak at their meetups remotely. Yeah. And so, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out long-term. Um, but, uh, what about 2019? What do you remember most about 2019 conference? 2019 was, yeah, it was probably the, the unexpected dramas that like are, are memorable. Um, I remember, uh, getting to have the coach school highlighted it was sort of like a, like a guest feature. It was really cool. To know, uh, where all the recent grads could go up there and just, cause they had their demo day. Um, and then they also shortly after that are able to present themselves to potentially a, a different audience. Um, given given the opportunity to also talk to school too was was it was a good opportunity. So yeah, that was that was really cool. I, I mean, it, and it's really selfish, but like I thought it was really cool um, to involve at least my my oldest son with the because uh, at that point he was a little guy he's, he's 12 now but there was uh, a great picture of you with him at that very conference too yes yeah, yeah get, let it, getting him to see that like hey this is something that like you know you don't have to have any experience to do like you just go ahead and start you know googling how to do something and you know you build something like this i thought that was really cool for him to see yeah yeah that is pretty cool I'm, it'll be interesting to see i know uh, we're going to be enlisting my kids to, uh, to help with some of the things around the conference, like ticketing and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see what their impressions are after the, uh, towards the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Giving people their name tags and whatnot. Yep. I'm sure at some point they're going to be sitting in a corner playing a game on the phone, but you know, oh, we'll, you we'll see how engaged we can keep them through, through the day. You can't expect them to stay interested. Like during a talk, <laughs> they got, they got to have something to do. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, so now talk about, you know, 2020, Yeah, we were, as, as you were, I know you were, had already started planning it in 2020 when the rug got pulled out from under us, but, but what was yeah. that like? Yeah. The, because we're going down memory lane, you know, pretty much, I remember that as like the world's longest break. So in, in, in that respect, um, yeah, I had begun with like early planning bits of it and then, uh, you know, I, tapered it, you know, when things started to look a little bit bleak, like, okay, we're all staying home from school, that kind of thing. And then when things got really scary. I was just like, I'm not doing this. Yeah. This is, this is not a good idea at all. Um, and that was like, you got to remember, like it's when you watch it and when you listen to this conversation in 2023, it's if you were like, weren't, and I think a lot of people, a lot of the viewers or listeners were actually in all this, so they probably will remember pretty clearly, but like prior to there being a vaccine it was like a really scary thing like neighbors weren't even like being near each oh, other yeah. and you know or you were forming a small bubble with your neighbors and you know one of you could go to the grocery store or all of them kind of thing okay. yeah um, my kids socially distant water gun fight with the neighbor's kids across the boundary of the yard with like a ten foot right cap. yeah and I, re I remember um like part of our small little bubble but that allowed some of that allowed the parents to work remotely was we had like uh, a nanny come in and take care of the kids, do the e-learning proctoring. And then my littlest, uh, my, my, my little girl, she was just a little baby walking around at that time uh, to be able to like, you know, to quarterback all of that. But I remember the nanny, she, um, she was having like her prom over that summer. Like they did it in somebody's backyard. Yeah. There was no prom for school. And so 
yeah, those, those were those were really difficult times. Uh, especially to plan something because you know you have no idea like well maybe all this will blow over by the fall maybe i should book it and that was really the story in 2021 when things i felt like were starting to get a little bit back to normal um and uh but i still just didn't i just didn't feel comfortable with it in 2021 um yeah there were a lot of precautions still happening there people were masking at work and kids were still I don't know, still having school policies and, and yeah there was the social distancing thing it was almost like should we have this conference outside yeah been a good idea actually that would have been a terrible idea in july <laughs> so we had to have like blast chillers on people to be able to sit outside uh, but yeah like when i look back like it felt like it all went in slow motion but when i look back on it, it felt like it was, it's it's all like fast forward though um because the amount of just like uh, not being able to to put the conference on for a third time uh, you know, because, you know, after the pandemic, my family went through some really big changes. Uh, my my now ex and I, we we separated and there was a lot going on. Family there wanted to really focus on, on on my kids and my house and my own personal well-being. I just couldn't, as the pandemic started to like ease up, I'm like entering into this new phase of my life where I'm like, there's different things going on. And I have to navigate this kind of thing. Um I just didn't really have it in the in my bandwidth to be able to put it on, you know. And I was living a different life than I was in 2018 and 2019. So yeah, uh, I'm very grateful that you're picking up because just from I told this to Robert really early on, is that like one of the big reasons I originally put this conference on is because I wanted to attend the conference. I wanted to be able to submit my own talks to this conference and be able to ex my own talks and never have to worry about anybody saying no to accepting the talks. And, it's just really funny is that like both of those years, I didn't have any talks because I, all of the other talks that were submitted were so good. I couldn't think I was like, I, I wouldn't be better than any of these. So we're not going, to, I'm not going to subject anybody to these. Um, and, uh, and then when you had your call for speakers and you'd reach out to me, it's like, Hey, you want to give a talk? And I was like, yeah, maybe. And just boiled down to like not submitting a talk. I really am excited about attending a conference like this because these conference, like this model of conference is my favorite model of conference. Like I've been to the big destination conferences. I've stayed in the conference hotel, all paid for by the company and that kind of thing. And those are cool for their own reasons, but the, like the type of conferences that really get me excited about learning and meeting people are just those ones that like half the people there you, you are people that you know, and half the people are there that you don't know, or you probably heard of or seen them posting somewhere uh yeah. you get to know them better it just feels a lot more personalized um and your experiences i mean i feel like you know for a smaller regional conference and you have you relate to people a, lo a lot easier um so yeah it's uh it's really nice I, I really like this model of conference more so i'm looking forward to you, attending it you, you you've set a pretty solid standard for for how things should operate and and that's why people love it uh, i know that um you know the the meetup groups in 2020 also kind of died there was a lot of there was a really active set of meetup groups with you know around specific languages and everything and it seems like a lot of them are using the the conference this year to you know we're we're trying to help relaunch some of them some of them didn't manage to to stick around or find ways to to operate uh, yeah you know, remotely well enough and, and i know that the uh upstate linux user group actually merged with the columbia group whenever they started doing remote because they could all come together uh, mm. a little bit easier and they've they've just stuck with that model they still have some people who you know, will get together in person here and there but uh but they they phone everybody in yeah. and so and others have, have learned about you know pulling in remote speakers uh, even if they can't uh, attend the event which is kind of broadened some horizons for people uh, but uh i know that hat greenville itself the the group and we have really talked a lot about hat greenville um but Hat Greenville is trying to drive a lot of uh, initiatives around around helping to get all these various groups off the ground uh, again, get them moving again. And the Polyglot Conference, I think, works really well for an annual event. Uh, I, I think it would have a lot more difficulty if it was more frequent than that as like a, a meetup group or something, just because people end up going to those meetup groups based on, you know, this is my favorite language, so I'm going to go here to learn more about this or to meet other people who are doing this thing. And companies are like, well, hey, we're doing, we're using, you know, Ruby or Python or whatever else. So I'm, I'm going to send people, I want to make sure people go to the Python meetup so we right. can recruit in the future and whatnot. But, um, but uh, Polyglot has a, has a little bit different draw there where it's more of a, 
but really is more of a broad community. I want to find out what else is going on and people only have so much time. Exactly. But, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think we've got a, a good balance this year and I'm hoping we can, uh, we'll be able to continue sustaining this stuff in the future. But, uh, no matter what, you are always going to be the founder of the Carolina Code Conference, and therefore you will always have a guaranteed ticket to the Carolina Code Conference every single oh, year. Golden ticket. <laughs> yeah, it, it is your it is your God given right passed down from founder to founder. <laughs> so, Thanks, so well, I appreciate that, and I'll continue to attend. Yep, you better. If you don't, I'm very upset. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, barring any like extenuating circumstances, um, I will I will be there. All right, I'm going to hold you to that. So okay. we'll get a sponsor to fly you in if you move out of the area if we have to. But no, where I mean, I'm planting roots here. That's what I'm happy to hear. All right, good deal. Uh, anything else you want to close out on? Anything you want to mention or promote while you're on? So, what would I say to a group of people after they've been to this conference? I would say uh, get involved with organizing the next one with you, right? Like you said, you'd have more people, like or local meetup groups. Local meetup groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get your talks ready for next year and uh, yeah, all that stuff. Absolutely. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, Joel, thanks for, for coming on and letting us, uh, you know, try out the, the podcast format. I'm sure this is not going to be the production quality that most, uh, that uh, any avid um, podcast listeners are, are used to just because again, my first time doing any of this stuff, but uh, we're going to have some, some good folks from uh, herd media or not herd media from, I think it is herd media. Uh, they're going to help us with the podcast. They're going to help us with the production of it and to, to make sure that everything is, uh, is done professionally to, to cast you in the best light po possible. And uh, we're looking forward to, to their support and helping us figure this stuff out and, and carry on the conference and the interest in it in future years. All right. Thanks a lot for your time, Joel. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you, Gary.